Old is green under the uh, rabbinic uh, leadership of Diane Zimmerman Shlita. Um, and a lot of our team members there were activated on phone calls, Zoom conferences uh, for those who were in distress. And uh, thank you for those who run the helpline, which is an invaluable service. And um, it's heartening to know that your communities and others can turn to the helpline in moments of dire need. Uh, you've all become aware that there was a tragic death by design, a suicide in your midst, and people reel from this, um, despite the fact that in the last few decades, this has unfortunately been uh, on a gradual rise in the religious communities throughout the world. Uh, but still, each loss of life is a tragedy, and each loss of life uh, through suicide, through ending one's own life, um, is, is catastrophic, not only for the family and the relatives and the friends and the neighbors, but really for all Yidin. And this is one of the reasons, as the Mavi says, that what do we do? What do we say? What is our response? when something that's so troubling, theologically troubling and psychologically troubling, and what do we do and what do we take from it and what what can we do for ourselves? And I think the, the focus of tonight's brief talk will be to provide parents and possibly mechanchem and teachers with some recommendations on how to speak to children at different ages. Uh, but before we do that, before we have some type of protocol for addressing our youth, it is very, very important that we address ourselves as adults. It's very important that in the immediate aftermath of knowing that this happened, and probably through the media and through other sources, people have vivid images of what they believe may have happened or what the scene might have looked like. And there, there's so much commotion and there's so much emotional turmoil that goes on that we owe it to ourselves as adults with Yerush and Mayim to stop and to acknowledge that we are having reactions. It's normal to find that whether in our thoughts, our imagery, our emotions, our physical sensations, our behavior, and sometimes even entering into our spiritual musings, um, that we are having some activity when we've heard about a tragedy like this. So it's normal to have reactions. It's not particularly normal to have no reaction. And in fact, we see from Chazal onward, through the Rishonim, through the Rari Musa, that when we hear tragic, shocking news, uh, that we need to spend some time looking inwards. When we can do that, we're in touch with our humanity. When we don't do that, and we just move on weiter, or we suppress out of awareness anything that might be happening inside of us, it's going to pop up later. It's going to haunt us later. There's no such thing. And this is, again, so there's Shalmi on this. There's other Chazal on this. But there's no such thing. It's a psikta of Kahana, Parsis Pinchas, that, that we don't succeed when we try to suppress our intense reactions. So we have to start by looking within what's going on inside of us. Ideally, we find someone who cares about us who we trust with whom we can share, we can ventilate, we can express the different ways this is hitting us. This is important for ourselves as adults. And also, this is what better equips us to be able to have a discussion with our own children. Because if we don't know where the pain or the fright is hitting us, and our children start unloading to us what's going on inside of them, either we'll listen impatiently to them, 
because it's triggering something in us, um, or we will overreact to what they're saying. So, so begin begin with yourself, look inward, acknowledge what you're going through, be honest with yourself. It's normal to have reactions when someone you know dies. It's normal to have reactions when we know that this person died by design. And that is not presupposing that I know what happened. I didn't know him. I don't know what he struggled with. I don't know um, what the nature of the suicide is because there are people who end their lives because of severe depression. There are people who take their lives out of despair. There are people, although we don't see them in our generations as much anymore, but there are people who in the past would take their lives on philosophical or theological grounds. And, and that was the Ma'abed Asma Midas, which probably Chazal were referring to with certain restrictions. Uh, but there are people who, who die on impulse. There are so many different ways that a person can be in distress and suffer, can reach the yish, the hopelessness, the despair, and make that fatal mistake. Um, but we don't, we don't want to go into a judgmental stance. It's not our task right now. It's not helpful to anybody. We don't want to label uh, this person. Uh, we want to preserve the dignity of his family. Um, and, and it is not our job to go and take a critical eye right now. Uh, our job, as I see it, as a professional and as a rabbi and a dying, uh, our job right now is to look at ourselves and to find ways to connect with our children and our, our students and one another so we can get perspective and we can, with time, we can, we can move ahead. So be mindful, find mm -hmm. someone to share it with, be honest with yourself and allow yourself to have the normal range of reactions. Avoid the judgment. It's not called for at this time. Most of us are not in a position where our opinion matters about that. Um, also, um, we have a statement that rumor control is damage control. It's one of the truisms I've introduced into High Lifeline's work that uh, this is not a time to engage in gossip or in rumoring. Um, and we've actually, we recommend that you give that message to your children that if they hear a version, a rendition of the facts that they don't know to be facts, don't repeat it even to your best friend. Come to mommy, come to Tati, come to the Rebbe, come to the Rub, come to the Rebbe Center and say, this is what I heard, am I allowed to repeat it? Um, but sometimes the tales that crop up in the aftermath of a Gotes tragedy are so distorted that when they get back to the Mishpacha, they cause unnecessary increased damage. And so this is a message for our children that if you hear something you don't understand it, approach me. And if I know the answer, I'll tell you. And if I don't have that information, I pledge to find out so that we can discuss it. Dr. Dr. Fox, sorry, just very quick. There's some people who have concern about hearing you uh, clearly. Is there a way of either turning up your mic or speaking a bit closer to the, to the mic, please, if you can try? Okay, thank you. Um, I much prefer to be told to speak up than not to speak. Um, but thank you for that. Is my voice any better now? I've turned my mic up to the maximum. Yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. Clearly. I'll even, even move closer and see if that helps. Is this okay? Yeah, that's a lot better. Thank you. Thank you for the prompt on that one. Okay, and I'm sorry if uh, some of my words were not discernible. I imagine there'll be a recording and uh, you can listen to that if, if you wish. Okay, so let's talk, uh, please, moving ahead to how we approach our children. My understanding is that the word is out. Uh, there is some descriptive information, as we would say, it's on the street, it's on the playground, it's in the cheder, it's in the shul, it's in the grocery store. 
so people are, are aware of the nature of the tragedy and certainly the identity of the person. Um, and it's very likely that your children have heard something. Um, it therefore is important in our opinion in the work that we've done in working in our kahilas, in the Hasidisha, in the Yeshivasha, in the Hamisha, in consulting with the Manhigim and Gedoli Hapoiskim. So again, this is an opinion predicated on very careful study and research. Um, but in our opinion, um, it is under these circumstances, it's important to have at least a few dialogues with your children. Now, younger children, and I would say children five and younger, generally speaking, who are not as cognitively astute and not as sophisticated, Baruch Hashem. So um, you can ask them if they've heard, you can ask them what they've heard. Um, and younger children generally are not going to have much of a reaction other than to mirror what they see in the parent. If the parent at Sabrachan is crying, is beside themselves, the child is going to be frightened and reflect some of that. If the parent is more calm um, and doesn't go into elaborate descriptions with the child, so sometimes um, a, a short statement is more effective. And, and yes, he was nifter, and we're very sad about that. And then if the child hasn't heard more and isn't asking any more questions, you leave it at that. Now I'm going to jump ahead and talk about teenagers, young people. Uh, for certain, we can generally assume that they've heard some details. And therefore, nothing is to be gained by camouflaging or disguising that from them. But we can approach a teen, a mature teen, um, and say, um, I'm sure you have heard the news by now, and you can name the name and you can mention the word suicide. Um, I don't think it needs to be disguised. I don't think idiomatic expressions, generally speaking, are fair or useful. Um, and say that you, you, you make some qualitative um, interpretive, interpretative statement about that, namely, this was a horrible tragedy, and you qualify it as such, or this was a, a, a terrible trauma, or this was a, a shocking event. You can make a statement. You can let them know how you are viewing this, and then you can say to them, if they don't spontaneously begin opening up, you say to them, what we've learned, we've sought hadracha, because this is such an unusual event, what we've learned is as parents that it's so important that we talk with you and that you talk with us. So you really want to open up the door for dialogue with them. Um, you want them to tell you what they've heard. You very much want all children at all ages to be open with how they're reacting to this. And virtually anything that child says to you whether it's a thought or whether it's an emotion, virtually anything they say to you, don't try to talk them out of it. Even with good intentions, don't say things like, oh, you shouldn't feel that way, or you don't have to have those thoughts. It's not going to help them if they are open enough with you to say, I'm sad, or I'm frightened, or how do I know it won't happen again? Or how do I know you won't do that? When they, when they go and they ask questions, virtually anything they ask or anything they share with you, you validate it. And validate doesn't mean being putting them through psychoanalysis. Validate means that if a child says, I'm scared, so you say, yes, this, this is scary. And of course, you're feeling scared. If a child says, I'm very, very sad. So you say, this is very sad news. And yes, you are feeling sad and talk about the sadness, talk about what you're feeling. We do want that child, that teenager especially, we do want them to be able to give a voice to their reactions. Again, whether it's thoughts, whether it's images, whether it's emotions, whether it's physical sensations, whether it's changes in their behavior that they notice, or even if 
as we said, some spiritual musings. It's a fact that I can't daven right now, or even if a person says, you know, how can I believe that such a thing would happen? Um, virtually anything they say, we, we embrace it, we validate it, we encourage them to give a voice to those reactions inside of them. Um, teenagers, I know we haven't gotten to the school age children yet, but teenagers very commonly do um, begin asking existential questions. Uh, teenage puberty is the time when the empathy begins to kick in, which means they're worried a little bit less about themselves and they're more empathically attuned to someone else's distress. So they may ask you questions like, "This must how 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 is his wife and children? How can they possibly be dealing with this?" They may ask you a question on others. They may ask questions like, "Why would someone do something like this?" Or, "What does Hashem? How does Hashem view him?" They may go into the theology. They may go into the existential. So, generally speaking, the questions that begin with the word "why," we acknowledge the question, but we don't try to answer it. We don't pretend that we can forenter their question. The why questions are very difficult. And what we say, we compliment that youngster. We say, you're asking very profound questions. You're a very sensitive person, and I'm very proud of you. And those are deep questions, which may take many years until you come up with an answer that makes sense to you. Or you can say to that, that youngster, um, I hadn't thought about that, or I hadn't thought about it that way. And I want to spend some time thinking about it. And, and I may want to ask someone, or maybe there's someone the two of us can approach about that question. Uh, but we, we generally aren't going to get very far if they ask why and we say because. Um, so it, be, be, be respectful of your teens and your older children that they may go into dimensions of thought um, which strike you. Um, but again, we validate, we complement, and we keep the line of communication open. The school age children, um, younger, meaning the children, let's say roughly, there's not an abject cutoff line, but let's say children below eight, let's say between five and eight, roughly speaking, um, many times, as I mentioned, they will mirror your reaction. So although if you feel like crying, it's appropriate to cry, but you don't want to be so dramatic that your child is afraid of what's happening to you. But if you are feeling sad, if you had a personal relationship with this, this individual um, and it's, it's hitting you at that level, you can be frank and candid with that child and, and display some of that sadness. But we do have to sort of set a rule recognizing that our children are impressionable and we don't want to frighten them. But those children five and eight, five through eight, uh, many times their reactions are going to be with questions, not even questions from Zach. They can be questions like, um, are they gonna dismiss us from school? Um, they can be questions like, uh, well, uh, do I have to do anything different because of this? but they can be asking questions which don't necessarily seem sensitive, or they may pick up the sadness, they may pick up the fright. They may ask questions like, is it contagious? Will this happen to someone else? How do I know that I'm safe? So younger children in that age range, they do tend to ask a lot of questions and approve of the questions. Don't harp on the child that they're not having a more sensitive reaction. We don't scold a child that they're not feeling something emotional, but we really go with the child. We do wanna educate the child that what happened as far as we know is something that the doctors say is very rare and it's very unusual. It's not something that's contagious or something that you can catch. You can say, in my opinion, under these conditions, you can say to children, including older children, that he was in great pain. There were areas in which he was, he was struggling and suffering. 
that we don't ourselves relate to, that we're not feeling the things that he may have been feeling, but he was in great pain. And from what we understand, that he got to a point where he could not handle that pain. And he didn't feel he had an option. Um, you can you can word it that way. Um, there's always a question, do you want to introduce it as a mental health issue? I think with older kids, we can. And we can say that some people, when they're struggling, they do go to professionals who are trained to treat these conditions. Um, and some people, they can reach a point of, of abject agony inside themselves that they're not thinking clearly. So I think that we can speak in, in sort of somewhat, somewhat nebulous terms. terms. Um, we don't have to go into a whole treatise on the nature of suicide with younger children. Um, but I think that we can couch it in that way that he was suffering deeply, he was in great agony, and he apparently got to a point where he wasn't thinking or planning carefully. And I think that can be said. And if the child asks a pointed question, they want to know more information, those which you can answer with brief answers, you do that. Those which you can't answer or you don't want to because you don't feel the child is mature enough to hear the answer, then you validate that they're sensitive in asking this. And then you'll tell them that I'm going to check into that. I'm going to see if I can find out more and then we can talk further. Um, I highly recommend that you not have these discussions with any of your children at nighttime or at bedtime. Bedtime and sleeping has to be a time where they can drift off with comfort and not wrestle with difficult thoughts and ideas. I also recommend that this not be the talk around the table. It should not be something that you discuss at the Suda, whether on Shabbos, Yom or even during the week. Um, this is something that you designate. You create the time to talk with your children at a time where you can focus on them with no distractions, which means not answering the phone during the call, not having any other interruptions. And the goal here is not to make it into a cheerful, pleasant, um, what sometimes is called toxic positivity. Uh, we don't need to reframe it at this time because it's not funny. And it's not something that we can just rapidly offer some type of perspective about. Um, and, and let ourselves, let our children, let them have the reactions. And I would lastly add, before I have to wrap up, I'll just have a couple more minutes. I would lastly add that this is possibly going to be a discussion that's more than one time, which means particularly if your child or your family knew this other family, um, but even if they don't, but you see that they're moved by the news that they've heard, um, you'll want to check in with them. You'll want to check up with them. You'll want to have this discussion. And then two days later, you say, let's sit down and see how you're doing. Sometimes children, once they vocalize their distress, they do better. Adults are like that also. When we find words that sometimes will diminish the intensity of our upheaval. But sometimes there's a dormant process going on in a younger person that doesn't really hit them initially. And then when they hear information from their friends in school or out elsewhere, um, then that begins to blossom into um, a stronger question or a more intense feeling. So you want to follow up and check in with your youngster. How are you doing? Let's talk. And acknowledge that this was a rough time and this was difficult news. And it's hard to process it. And for that reason, we do want just to check in with, check in with you and see how you're doing. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for two Ruchnius goals. One is, this is your opportunity as adults to model for your children, for your family, how an adult with Yerushalayim copes with tragedy. That we have a mahalach, we're honest, we talk about it, 
we're self-aware. And we model that this is how Yid responds to tragedy. And the second goal is that this is, this is a time, I say this with great sincerity, that your children need your embrace. Bihayiten Eliboy also means that you, you want to you want to be cognizant that your children need your love and they need your patience. They need to be able to connect and bond and to know they can communicate with you. And, and this is a time to take advantage of your ability to better connect more wholesomely with your child so your child feels they can in times of their own sadness, in times of their own distress, that they can come to you and you'll be receptive and you'll be encouraging and you'll be supportive. So these are important Ruchmiya's goals at a time like this. This is a horrible tragedy. That, that Hashem Kodesh Baruch will give us the skills to work through this. Uh, but we do have, in my opinion, we do have to address it. There's an agenda we follow. Um, I regret that I have to sign off. I'm going to turn to the helpline personnel. Are there any pressing questions that came up on the chat? I wasn't reading the chat, but are there any things you feel need to be need to be addressed uh, immediately? Yes, there's um, a couple of, first of all, um, the big question is that this was a, a very well-respected mechanic um, who was there for, for many, many teenage boys. And they felt that, that they, they felt that their the carpet's been pulled out of their feet. Yeah. And then there's a lot of questions as well about whether if we have to tell our children they're off school now, if they haven't heard about it yet, should we tell them in case they hear about it from somebody else? I, I think it's inevitable in most Kahilas that they will hear it's always better to hear from a parent or a responsible adult than to hear a juvenile version of it. So if, if you're the one who brings it up, preemptive, this is my opinion professionally, that the responsible thing is to bring it up. And you can bring it up not in a morbid way. Uh, you can bring it up in the way, that, the gentle way that I've been describing. So I do think that's important. Um, was did I cover that question, or was there another part of the question? No, that that was covered. That's that's very clear guidance. And there was the the one about the the, the you know there's the so many teenagers who are feeling guilt. You know they were they weren't good in school, or they were, or, or the, the carp has been pulled out their out the rug has been pulled out their feet because this was their mechanic, this was their principal. They may not have seen eye to eye with him always, but they a lot of them did did get a lot of guidance from him. And there's guilt, confusion. Etc. with a lot of teenage boys. Yeah, and I think that's something that can affect all of us. Anytime a prominent person, the Clay Kodish, a role model, has come to any type of tragedy or even any type of scandal, lo alenu, uh, I think that can shake uh, our foundation. And that needs to be talked through if your youngster mentions that or you sense that that's what they're struggling with. You can bring that up. The goal is not to be malshan, to demonize, to judge the other person, but yes, to acknowledge that this is this is this is even more difficult for us to initially cope with because we knew this person, we we looked up to him, we had respect, we had some relationship with him, and I think that needs to be talked about. I don't think it can be swept away. Um, the 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 risk of course, is that children will feel betrayed and that they can't always trust people in positions of authority. And to a degree, I do believe that you can counter that by talking about it, by letting them see that they can turn to you as parents and they can trust you. And a child who's really re wrestling with that, you can help them identify a, a favorite teacher or a favorite Rebbe who they have a relationship with. Maybe it's the Shul Rebbe's and the others, maybe it's the Rav, whomever it is, and suggest that, that this is something they might want to talk about to get a Hashkafic perspective on this. Um, I've written an article or two about this topic, about the role model 
Hoop Falls and, and how it impacts us and what we can do with that. I might be able to furnish you with that article. Um, but I don't think if a youngster brings this up or that comes into your discussion, I don't think you can rapidly reframe it and give them a different perspective. I think we have to sit with that as it sort of foments inside the youngster as they're wrestling with it, commend them for the fact that they're able to talk about it and agree with them that you want to work on this with them. You, whether it's through talking with someone else, whether it's learning something from a safer, whether it's having just repeated dialogues about it. Um, but if a child is feeling that sense of betrayal or that sense of disbelief or that sense of confusion, validate it and move gradually towards some next step with them. Okay, I have to wrap up. I apologize. I only had this half hour. Um, Thank you. But if if um, it would be useful at any point to remain in touch, please, you know how to reach me. Mm -hmm. And um, we do have a supportive team in Stanford Hill and, and in Golders Green. And we also have in, the, in our American offices, we do have um, a different type of helpline. It's just a general crisis line um, and not in any way competing with what you're doing. But when people are seeking guidance for their children, how to speak to their spouse, um, if if uh, if that would be of use, you can certainly turn to High Lifeline in, in America. A good yantif, a good show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Fox. Thank you. Thank you.